We started in hard times to bring us all in Into the laughter through thick and through thin For public power enthusiasts without and within Roll on enthusiasts, roll on Roll on enthusiasts, roll on Welcome to Public Power Underground, I'm Crystal Ball I'm Matt Shretnick And I'm Paul Dockery Today we are joined by Federal Energy Regulatory Commission Chair Rich Glick, FERC's chair. I got to know Rich uh, when we worked in uh, Washington, D.C. together. I was in the Bonneville Power Administration's Washington, D.C. office, and Rich was advisor to U.S. Secretary Bill Richardson during the Clinton administration. You left the Secretary's office to be Pacific Corps' lobbyist in Washington, D.C., and at the time, the utilities in the Northwest were exploring and developing a regional transmission organization, organization proposal called RTO West. Can you believe it's been 20 years <laughs> since then? So it's on the verge of happening then? It's on the verge of happening now, right? <laughs> it's always on the verge. <laughs> Before joining the commission, Chair Glick was general counsel for the Democrats on the Senate Energy and Re- National Resources Committee when Washington Senator Marie, Maria Cantwell was the chair of the committee. Prior to that, he was vice president of government affairs for Iberdrola's renew- renewable energy, electric and gas utility, and natural gas storage businesses in the United States. He also served as director of government affairs for PPM Energy, which was based in Portland, and before that was director of government affairs for Pacific Corps. Did I get something wrong? I think we're going to edit on the fly here. Yeah, so uh, she, uh, she was the ranking Democrat. Uh, the, the Republicans were, the, were in the, with the chairs at that time. So Senator, Senator Cantwell was the ranking Democrat. Just that was, yeah. Yes, I love this. Okay. I, yes, do that throughout. Okay. Correct me Sorry. throughout. I always make mistakes. <laughs> okay. Okay. We sometimes That was my take mistake. I wrote oh, that in. You did? I, you gave it it just, I did. That. Wishful oh. thinking. It's more fun now. Now it's more interactive already. It is. Uh, Chair Glick was nominated to FERC by President Trump in August 2017 and confirmed by the U.S. Senate on November 2nd of that year. He was named chair of the commission by President Biden on January 21st, 2021. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is an independent agency that regulates the transmission and wholesale sale of electricity and natural gas in interstate commerce, as well as the transportation of oil by pipelines in interstate commerce. FERC also reviews proposals to build interstate natural gas pipelines, natural gas storage projects, and liquefied natural gas terminals, and licenses non-federal hydropower projects. Chairman Glick, again. Welcome to Public Power Underground. Yes, welcome. This well is a done. great honor. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's good to be back in the Northwest. Yeah, so you've been here. Like you were in Portland. Portland a lot? So, so I never, I always worked out of Washington, D.C., uh, but I always worked for companies that were headquartered out here, so I came back quite frequently. I love That's it. That's a good excuse. It's a nice city. It's a great city. It's a great city. Great region. A great Absolutely. region with great public power partners. In That's the true. And yes. unique attributes. Unique attributes. <laughs> Different than every other part of the country, I'm told. <laughs> yeah. Like all the other parts <laughs> of the yes, country. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful snowflakes just like everybody else. Yes. Um, can we say why uh, we have Rich here? In Please the do. Thank Please you. give us some context <laughs> as to why we're all, actually all in the same room together. Yeah. This is a rare thing. Yeah. The it second is. time we, the mm-hmm. three of us, have done it. Right. Uh, I did like the idea of just having the audience figure you had come specifically for this conversation. Yeah. Oh. But there's more to it than that. <laughs> <laughs> we did invite uh, Chairman Glick to the PNOC, Pacific Northwest Utilities Conference Committee, board meeting um, this week. Uh, it was our second in-person meeting in Portland this year. Uh, Rich, thank you for doing that. I uh, really appreciate that. We had um, an hour-long conversation with you. Uh, you shared your vision, and you had a lot of answers to a number of questions. Um, and I think we've really kicked off a conversation that we've needed to have in our region for a long time about um, moving transmission forward here. Well, there were, there were a lot of questions. I'm not, hopefully I had uh, reasonable answers to them. But it was actually, it was, it was, it was great to hear from folks. And I, I just, what amazes me is how different the region is now mm-hmm. versus what it was 20 years ago, right? Mm-hmm. It was, it's, uh, there, there's, I mean, the conversation has really expanded. I think in part public power is no longer in the just say no camp. There are some public power members that are supportive of moving forward with some sort of regionalization effort. But nonetheless, the biggest difference, I think, is the resource adequacy issues that have come up over the last several years and people realizing that the status quo it's no, it's no longer attainable or achievable. Yeah, on yeah, the verge. 
I was uh, I was on a panel the other day with uh, with uh, somebody from Bonneville, and they, they made the case that you know, you can't judge the base cases the status quo anymore. Um, and I think the region is in some ways coming to terms with the fact, and public power in the region is open to making sure we have a good eyes wide open approach to the future. And it's good to hear you mention that you you've picked up on that a little bit. It sounds mm-hmm. like well, they, a lot of public power folks come to DC as well, and we meet with them at, at the commission. And it's just it's 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 just to me it's just interesting the evolution. We talked about resource adequacy, but the other issue that I think is different than it was 20 years ago is the weather. I mean, we all talk about the weather, but in fact, the weather is extremely important from a reliability perspective, the extreme weather conditions that we're seeing around the country, but in, including the West. And, and it's just, it, again, I think the status quo is just no longer, um, it, it's, it's just not, people realize they need something different. Yeah. Absolutely. Ready to get into it? And the resource mix is changing. Mm-hmm. Evolving resource mix. Yes. I think I can hit the typewriter. You think I can find the button to hit the typewriter? Yes. Nope. Close. <laughs> yes. Hey, there you go. Good transition. Good transition. Yeah. Ready? <laughs> All right. Chairman Glick, let's start with FERC's strategic plan. Earlier this year, you released a new five-year strategic plan, which outlines the commission's critical priorities, including modernizing and protecting the electric grid, improving electric infrastructure siting reviews, and bolstering public participation in commission proceedings. At the time, you noted America's energy landscape is undergoing profound change. The development and demand for cleaner electricity is real, is rapidly reshaping the resource mix. And as a result, a large amount of additional electric transmission infrastructure is needed to address these issues and facilitate the participation of these new resources in wholesale electric markets efficiently while maintaining the reliability of the electric grid. So one of the six pri- priorities that caught my attention is FERC's strategic um, focus on facilitating the development of the electricity infrastructure needed for the changing resource mix. Please talk about your vision for how to accommodate the evolution of the electric grid more efficiently and cost effectively, and how the strategic plan demonstrates FERC's responsiveness to these changes. Well, thanks, Crystal. The, you know, the Transmission is such a vital part of the of, 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 of the whole the entire electric grid. Obviously, building more transmission is necessary for a variety of reasons. It's certainly in large part to access the you know we talked about the clean energy transition, and certainly that's it's well underway. Uh, and we know that we have we, the United States is blessed with just tremendous uh, wind resources, tremendous solar resources. Primarily, those resources are located in areas where not a lot of folks live. So you have to really build out the transmission grid to access those resources, and there's, there's, there's great demand for that. But in addition to that, as I mentioned, the, the weather a second ago, with extreme weather conditions from, and, and reliability is becoming a much bigger factor in, 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 the, in the debate, the debate over where we're headed in terms of the clean energy transition as well. And uh, we, we've seen examples in other parts of the country where access to transmission helped keep the lights on and, and lack of access to transmission did, did just the opposite, caused blackouts. And uh, we recognize that in, in order, if we're going to be having to address these one in a hundred year weather events that happen now every other year, mm-hmm. we're going to have to figure out a way to make the grid much more resilient, much more responsive. And one of the ways to do that certainly is to build out the transmission grid to have great, better interconnectedness between utilities and between regions. Can you, uh, one element that tra- is the transmission of this plan, but also in this energy transition, as we talk about the changing resource mix, another component of that is, and I think in the strategic plan, you, you point to it as like the price formation to, uh, to try to get the attributes necessary for managing the modern transmission grid. Can you talk a little bit about that price formation issue and, and the different ways the changing resource mix needs new mechanisms for price formation? Sure. So, first of all, it, it, uh, everyone says the same thing, right? The, so the wind doesn't blow all the time and the sun doesn't shine all the time, right? right. Yeah. Yeah, but, but in reality, that's, that's true. And so the grid needs to be responsive to that. There are times where, where we need to have other generation that can act fast, whether, for instance, if a cloud comes over a solar farm or um, the wind dies down unexpectedly for, for whatever reason. Um, we need a, a generation that's responsive to that. Now, some of that is going to be electric storage. Electric storage is certainly, and in the West, it's proven to be very, effective to address some of those issues. But we also need other, res- other resources as well, again, to be, um, uh, to be responsive, to be more flexible, to provide the flexibility that the grid needs. Um, and uh, one, of the, one of the ways we need to do that is, is to actually adequately or accurately price 
the value that these resources provide. In many cases, we've been paying resources for just sitting there and being available when we need them to be there. And there's some benefit to that as well. But you could have a lot of, you know, on a very um, hot day, the wind dies down all of a sudden. It takes 24 hours to start up one power plant and the other 10 minutes to start up the other power plant. Meanwhile, we're paying them the same. That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we're doing at FERC, and we've had a couple of technical conferences on this issue so far, is trying to figure out how to adequately value the, the flexibility that some generation provides and, and more importantly, how to adequately compensate um, uh, those, those resources for the benefits that they do provide the region. We're still working on it. It's a very difficult issue, but I think that's going to be the trend in pricing in the future. It's focusing on the attributes of a generating facility, not just the generating facility itself. And you mentioned uh, batteries and, yes. and, and like that energy storage yes. attributes. Is, is there anything uh, like interesting you'd share with us around how that can evolve and how that can be, uh, and, you know, it doesn't have to be interesting. Any thoughts you think <laughs> it would be fun to share yeah. around uh, specifically those types of resources? Because they're new on the grid and, you know, there, there have been, their storage hydro is that type of yes. a resource, but batteries are a new way to kind of manage that. Anything? So, on that. so the interesting is in the eye of the beholder, but, yeah, exactly. uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it a bit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wonky I'm interested. Yeah. So, so I, you know, and I've been talking a lot with the ISO recently. I had a, a meeting earlier with Elliot Mainzer, who runs the ISO, and I think everyone in the Northwest obviously knows him very well. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's really interesting to me that the, um, the battery storage has really – They've, they've installed a significant amount of additional battery storage in California over the Absolutely. last several years, and it's performed really well. Mm -hmm. Now, there are limits, and I think that, unfortunately, you hear from some people all the time about the limits. And obviously, four-hour lithium-ion batteries do, do have their limits in terms of how much you can charge them, how frequently you can charge them back and forth, and how available they are after the four hours are up, right? But, 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 but they are serving to keep the lights on in California. There's no doubt that California is a much better uh, reliability situation uh, now than they were a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I think the um, one of the things I think that that, that, that is, um, you know, so again, sometimes it gets lost in the debate. People say, oh, that battery storage, um, that, that'll never amount to anything. But it's already amounting to a lot in California. Yeah. People yeah. need to pay attention. Secondly, there are uh, significant technological breakthroughs that, that the labs are working on, the national labs are working on, PNNL here in the Northwest and others, some down in, in, in New Mexico as well, that I think is really going to be a, another game changer, provide another opportunity to provide uh, battery storage that actually is going to provide much more um, uh, ability to keep the lights on on, on, a, on a more continuing basis as opposed to just four hours at a time. And uh, in addition to that, we shouldn't just focus on battery storage. The Northwest is, is, is really has significant potential or pump storage facilities. And yeah. we already see that the federal hydropower system actually acts as a battery in mm -hmm. some ways. Yeah. But also the, um, the pump storage, I think, is going to play a big role. It takes years to develop those projects. It's expensive. But when they get online, I think it's going to have a significant positive, significantly positive impact. Yeah. One of, the, uh, one of the more interesting uses, from my perspective, of, uh, of battery storage is uh, uh, transmission congestion yes. and the, the benefit you can have from that perspective and the fact that it's one of those few areas where the sum – or rather, I should say, the whole is actually greater than the sum of the parts at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, I'm, I'm curious, when it comes to, we're, we were talking a bit earlier about um, transmission planning, for example, is that it, is it possible for, um, for FERC to recommend kind of a, uh, a parallel approach with that? or? Well, a couple of things. First of all, we, uh, th this you want to talk about wonky. This is very wonky. Yes, <laughs> get into it. Get into <laughs> it, all the wonky. FERC has been, uh, on a couple of occasions, uh, uh, battery storage developers, project developers have sought to, for us to treat the storage as a transmission asset as yep. opposed to a um, generation asset. And I'm not going to get, there's a lot of case law out there and some of it, the commission has said yes. And sometimes the commission said no, depending on certain facts. But I think you're seeing more uh, increasing interest in the storage community for treating storage as, as transmission. One, because it's easier to finance because you get a guaranteed, yep. you, know, you get your money back in a guaranteed rate of return. Um, but secondly, because of the functions that you mentioned about it providing you know, reducing congestion on the transmission grid, for instance, so, so essentially acting like you added more transmission to, to the grid. Um, secondly, and this goes back to Order 1000, the commission does require, although this isn't necessarily something that each region does well at this point, does require a consideration of alternatives to transmission. And, I've, and, and in the past, there have been several examples where uh, the regional planners did consider, and in some cases, I think, chose battery storage over, um, over tr new transmission development. Great question. Great transition to transmission. Yes. Yeah, it may have been a bit selfish on my part there. <laughs> Are you a, 
your storage developer or something? No. Okay. <laughs> not, at not at all. No developers in the okay. room, okay. actually. We're all electric utility enthusiasts. enthusiasts. That's right. <laughs> are you an electric utility enthusiast? Uh, On the record, are you an electric utility enthusiast? I'm an energy enthusiast. Oh. But FERC is FERC doesn't just do electricity, so we have to be even-handed. Okay. Oh. Do I need to get some new merch? This is an energy enthusiast. Energy enthusiast. Yes. Yes. Exactly. yes. Okay. Maybe we need some new merch. Check what you're well aware of the difficulty surrounding uh, transmission development development and expansion um, uh, with respect to what you've called the two most significant challenges we face uh, developing new transmission infrastructure. And you spoke to this a little bit earlier, those two being planning and cost allocation. Right. Um, now, further, given your professional background, um, and as we discussed, you understand the challenges that we, that we face and that we have in the Northwest due to our unique composition, um, beautiful snowflakes that we are, of jurisdictional and non-jurisdictional entities, um, and not to mention uh, the federal entity of the Bonneville Power Administration, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested in any words of wisdom you might have for those of us who are, are, are working to uh, kind of uh, allay the concerns of particularly some of our public power colleagues who see only the cost risks of transmission regionalization and expansion um, and who may not understand or necessarily believe, necessarily believe that the benefits, uh, financial or otherwise, uh, may outweigh those. So I'll start with reliability and then talk about the economics slash environmental impacts. From a reliability perspective, I think things are much different than they used to be in the Northwest. The Northwest used to, I, I think people, I remember people saying about Bonneville and the federal hydropower system, we have more capacity than we know what to do with yeah. here. We have no problems. We don't, we don't have anything. It's not like those here. California people, exactly. Um, that's changed dramatically, obviously, with concerns about resource adequacy. And, and, and also, the, the, I'm going to come back and talk about the weather again. But was it was it last year, right, where Seattle and Portland hit like outrageously high temperatures at the same time? San Francisco and other, other some of the coastal cities in California had very high temperatures, yeah. and it, 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 so I think w from a reliability perspective, we're going to require an increasing amount of interregional transfers transfer of energy, and uh, it used to be again very simple in the in the summer. The Northwest sent their power down to California and Arizona, and the winter they got it back. The, the, the weather patterns don't always. Um, call for that anymore and yeah. i think that the extent that you have limited transmission capacity as we saw last summer as well as with what happened with the california oregon inter inter tie um uh, it, it's it's essential that we build out the grid for that reason secondly again from a just a, a, an economic perspective um i think there are uh, i know there are a lot of people there are times of the year that people the mid-seas for instance have this excess hydropower capacity they want to make some money. They got to get the power elsewhere where there's higher demand, where there's higher prices at the time. And to be able to do that, you need more transmission. And then finally, uh, I think most of the, well, certainly uh, in the Pacific Northwest, but um, some of the other states in the West as well, a very um, dramatic or very aggressive uh, uh, goals with regard to reducing carbon emissions. That's going to require not only in-state renewable energy, there's a lot of that, mm -hmm. but it's also going to require some of these big projects like in a state like Wyoming where, again, not a lot of people live, but they have a lot of potential, they, and we need to get the grid built to be able to, for those markets, to be able to access those markets in California, um, but also Arizona and the Northwest as well. And I think um, you just can't. There's no state is an island, and and, and no state is going to be able to achieve their goals with the uh, uh, with their own renewable resource potential. They're going to have to rely on others as well and share during different times of the year. I like the message you had um, during our board meeting. It just makes the most sense. Right, right. There's, uh, I think that, um, you know, again, I don't want to use the island example again, but the fact is that the Northwest, the, the whole West, if you look at the history, and I did some of this when I was on Capitol Hill, I looked at some of the history here, it was built, the whole system was built in a way for different regions to rely on different, um, uh, the other regions during different parts of the year, during different weather patterns, now weather patterns are changing, but nonetheless, it's, it's, you can't, you can't uh, achieve reliability, you can't achieve cost effectiveness, and you can't achieve your Climate goals, if you're going to try to do it all on your own. Does that speak a little bit to the diverse, just the diversity benefit of a bigger footprint in some ways? Absolutely. I mean, I mean okay. to, to borrow this, you know, people always say it's like 5 o'clock somewhere when they talk about, you know, drinking. But <laughs> it's always windy somewhere, right? In the West, especially in the West, it's always windy somewhere. So, yeah, so it dies down in... Uh, in the in the in the in the Columbia in the, in the Columbia yeah. River Range, right? But then in Montana it might be picking up, or, or or even in you know Eastern Oregon or someplace like that. Idaho, and, 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 and yeah, Idaho exactly. Another example, a great state. I hear. I hear. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, it, 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 you, the problem is without the transmission grid, everyone's building the same renewable energy, and especially the Northwest in the same exact spot. Mm -hmm. And they need to diversify for that very reason. The weather the weather's diverse. Mm -hmm. 
the gorge comes to mind. Yes. Um, following up on, on something you said with respect to different states having different standards and, and no one is going to be able to meet theirs by themselves, um, it, it just be interested in your perspective on, on um, how much of a hurdle the uh, uh, bifurcated um, regulatory construct that we're, that we're seeing throughout the West is to um, – kind of comprehensive planning and, and sensible planning from uh, not just a transmission perspective, which we've touched on, but also from a resource planning and reliability perspective. So th- throughout the country, I think our regulatory structure is somewhat convoluted. And I know people from other countries come here and they, they can't understand how our approach works with the 50 different state utility regulators, yeah, as well as for utilities and regulation. Well, that's true. That's true. <laughs> that's probably true for a lot, for a lot of different things that states um, per- regulate, per- regulate oversee. Um, but I think with regard to, uh, uh, the, the 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 approach of of of, of you know states and then and, and FERC it just it, it it doesn't really it doesn't recognize the fact that 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 energy markets have always been regional in nature throughout yeah. the country and it's not just electricity natural gas markets oil markets oil markets are even slightly different but nonetheless it's never been no no state has ever been self sufficient on even ta- even a state like Texas mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. they're relying on others others as well and I think sometimes we don't well, from a regulatory perspective, we don't treat it that way. Now, it's a little bit easier in the, those regions that actually have RTOs up and running because they actually engage in that regional planning, whether it be transmission or from a resource perspective. Um, they actually engage in, um, uh, you know, f- from a forecasting from a regional perspective, not as what, what not what just what West Virginia needs, but what all PJM needs. Right. And that doesn't, that there are a lot of, believe me, there are a lot of internal conflicts between the states, especially when West Virginia wants to go in a different direction than New Jersey, for instance, as an example. But it's still a hell of a lot easier for, to get everybody in the room and try to hammer something out, mm-hmm. as opposed to the, the West, which really there's not much of an incentive to do that outside of reacting to an emergency like a resource adequacy issue or something. Mm-hmm. It can, so, you know, I, I live and work in the Northwest and have that perspective in my mind, but I do try to pay attention to what's happening in the rest of the, re, in the, rest of the country. What, any thoughts on, like, MISO's long-range planning? Is that, to me, it's one of those success stories that we in the Northwest should be thinking yes. about the value of an RTO because yes. something like MISO's long-range planning transmission expansion can happen under that framework. And my thought is maybe that's a little bit easier under that framework than under our current, to Matt's point, yeah. kind of bifurcated system. It, am I learning the right lesson kind of from what's available in that? I, trend? I think so. I think, first of all, it, it's not, but it, 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 the way the transmission planning process is set up, it shouldn't just be limited to those regions that have RTOs. So, for instance, the Northwest has yeah. a you know, transmission, grid. that northern grid that got, you know, two regions got put together, and then there's the, the other parts of the West have other regions, and then there's the ISO. So you actually can... That type of transmission planning can go can can uh, take place outside of an RTO outside the RTO process too. It's easier in the RTOs in large in large part because in MISO, for instance, the states are used to working together. They have yeah. a they have an organization of MISO states is what they call it, and they actually participate in almost every decision, major decision that MISO makes. Mm-hmm. Uh, at least they provide um, both recommendations and they make filings at FERC, for instance, when, when we approve or disapprove those 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 proposed changes in their tariffs, for instance. But um, uh, so, so they actually have a better, and they have a history here that this is their second time around. They've gotten together and put together a plan that worked for everyone in terms of transmission development. It wasn't just, well, this part, that, you know, this is only going to help my state, this particular project. Well, that project might help a different state. And so um, the, they're able to actually sit, sit down and work that out, and they're all sharing the benefits of it. And so far, it's taken a lot of effort, a lot of time. But um, it, it's, it is definitely a, an example of, of something that when, when the states work together, um, that can actually achieve something very positive. Good. That's a lesson I took. That's what I tell people, too. I show it as an example of things. Yeah. That Let's can, put that in the show notes. Maybe we can put it in the show yeah, notes. Yeah, yeah like absolutely. It. They're show notes. Dude. Yeah, oh. yeah, absolutely. Do you have any that. documents you want us to <laughs> Any links any, uh, you want us to share with us? Uh, with you this can get the, FERC, uh, the, the, uh, the strategic, strategic plan. plan yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's in there. It's in there. <laughs> I'm sure Don't. people will love reading it. <laughs> any more you guys want to talk about transmission? Or we can, uh, I got another question for you. I think you're up. I'm up. Ready? So uh, in the West, we talked about earlier today, we seem to be coalescing around this like incremental approach to market expansion. Um, and in, in thinking through it, there, there are undoubtedly in any approach, there are trade-offs and stumbling blocks. Right. Um, but I was hoping like to get your insights into what we should be paying attention to in the incremental approach to make sure we don't fall over a stumbling block. 
So, you know, to me, it's, it's somewhat like a test run, right, of an RTO. Now, an incremental approach, in my opinion, takes a long time, sometimes too long. Uh, but I also understand the realities of, of, of what's on the ground here in, in the West, and I don't think just starting with an RTO, it's probably not going to be a successful uh, project. So, but um, in terms of, you know, I, th I think issues like governance, governance is always, around the country, I can tell you, the complaint I received the most about RTOs in general, it's governance. Okay. Everyone hates the governance. No one, no one's happy with it, whether it be utilities, transmission owners, consumer groups, state regulators, uh, environmental organizations, none of them like the governance in any of the regions of the country. And I think here, although this, but some are better than others. So, for instance, I mentioned a second ago the MISO organization, of MISO states. They play a pretty significant role in the way MISO okay. um, uh, makes their decision make decisions, as does in SPP. The states have a pretty big role there as well. And I think the lesson to be learned from there is that if people are concerned about ceding power or losing authority, you, you can actually uh, address a lot of that through the through the governance process. And I know there's a lot of discussions going on here out mm -hmm. in the West about governance, about California ISO board versus um, other mechanisms, and what role can the states play, what can, role can public power play in the decision-making process. And I would say, that, you know, it's kind of a blank slate. Try to... I would recommend to the region, it's easier said than done, but come up with something that works for everybody. And it might be a model. I, I, I you know, I, I never want to, certainly I don't want to prejudge my vote and I'm not going to prejudge any of my colleagues' votes either. But FERC is very, when, when, when a region comes to, comes to us with something, we're often deferential, as long as it's not completely contradictory to what the Federal Power Act requires. Okay. We're very deferential. And issues like governance, I think, would be very, likely be very deferential uh, towards something. that, and, and I think it would actually build some more trust among the states and the California ISO as they mm -hmm. move forward, whether, whether it's EDAM or what's EDAM, whatever after, is after EDAM. Yeah, so in, that, so in the incremental approach, that governance is important because it provides a framework for expansion, you think? Is that one well, of the... Well, it provides a framework for everything they do. So, for instance, um, uh, when, when the, uh, whatever, whatever, however, the, the market design of EDAM, for instance, let's say there's someone wants to change it. There's, it's not working. There needs to be a change. Yeah. How, do you, how do you actually agree to it? So, for instance, in some regions of the country... Uh, some some parties some of the some of the parties have filing rights under the Section 205 of the Federal Power Act. I don't want to get even more wonky, except to say it's advantageous to have a filing right. If it's not, if you don't, so other regions don't have that, in term, and so it's helpful. Or at least certain stakeholders don't have that. So it's it's, it's helpful to write those those types of things okay. into the agreement, um, and also from a planning perspective, I think to the extent you think you have a seat at the table, or you know you have a seat at the table, and you, you can whether whether there's a, a future plan, a transmission plan, for instance. You can actually have an inf influence over that versus a situation where you have to get like some some regions have you have to get like seventy five percent of the vote, including like five out of the six yeah. subsectors. I'm just making that up, but that's the, that, that it's it's way too complicated and it causes a lot of um, I think it causes inefficient decision making. Are you are you hopeful of market expansion in the West and in the evol evolution to a regional or trade or transmission or regional trade organization? Yeah, we got plenty yeah. of those. Yeah. <laughs> we got plenty of those. Yes. Yeah, an RTO. Are you hopeful? Do you, yeah, do you I, see I, a path? more than hopeful. I I I, I saw that I said this twenty years ago, so obviously I was wrong then. But but I I, I think it's inevitable. I, it is inevitable that, that first of all, there's just too many benefits um, from a reliability perspective. Also, as I mentioned earlier, just I think. You, you can't integrate the amount of renewable energy, intermittent generation we're talking about on a, a, a you know, a control area by control area basis. You need to do that in a much more thought out and, and process where there's a lot of shared responsibility and so on. And I know that's where the region's headed. The region's on its own timetable. I have to be honest, I'm not, I'm, I, I wish it was faster. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Prehistoric. But it, it's, it, it's, I, I think the fact is it's, um, it's going to happen because it's just, it just makes too sense, too much sense not for it okay. not to happen. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, what, what, if I had my druthers, would I say that we should have one in five years as opposed to whatever, however long it's going to take? Yes, but um, I think sometimes it's better to do things organically and build support for it. Uh, we've seen in the past when proposals came both from in the region and from FERC, it caused a lot of angst out here in the region. It set back, mm -hmm. and also the California, the experience in the California energy crisis set back mm -hmm. um, uh, ex uh, progress for a number of years. Yeah. Back when I was at Montevale, I'd heard it uh, uh, compared to or the, 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 the fusion analogy, right? Everyone always says fusion, just like 10 years ago, fusion right. is 10 years away. Um, Except it's, they're, making, they're actually making some progress well, and, on it. And exactly, and I was just <laughs> going to say, I'm hoping that the, uh, um, that remains true in the sense that it sounds like we're getting really close in both, both regards. Yep. So 
Um, I, I think I saying also it's, remain hopeful. Saying it's inevitable though is a little bit different because there's no set yeah. timeline on that. It could. You're not wrong yet that it was inevitable because it could. It's right. not. But it, it, it did yet. That, not, that was not the end of inevitable. Well, fusion's yeah, not creative. inevitable, but I think an RTO in the West is. <laughs> <laughs> well, fusion's happening, just not here. It's right, well, exactly. Successful fusion yeah. Yeah. Yep. implementation. Yep. Oh, great. This is wonderful. Thank you for having us. I have an outro game, but just in case people don't want to listen to the outro game, maybe you can read us out and then we can play a game. And then, uh... As somebody who likes to give Paul a hard time for games, I would like to go on record as recommending you stick around for the outro game. Yeah, are you willing to stick around for the outro game? I thought I have no choice. I have to stick around for the game. <laughs> you always have a choice. I'm We're kidding. No, no, absolutely. I'm glad, I'm glad to do it. All right. Well, Chairman Glick, thank you for the conversation. Uh, Paul's going to put links to reference materials uh, that you mentioned in the show notes, like we already talked about, uh, where it may go without saying. You'll also find links to merch. Maybe I'll get some energy enthusiast energy merch just enthusiast. real quick. Oh, maybe what do they sell? Oh. We got quarter zips. I didn't wear it. I thought about wearing it today. feel like I need to put a jacket on. We got nice quarter zips. You know, I feel like I, I owe... Um, uh, just, uh, I, I, I feel like I need to go shopping and okay. I, I think I need to go shopping for my friends. Um, okay. and even though it's not yet energy enthusiasts, I, th- I think, um, somebody might be getting something electric, you feel you, you electric, you electric utility enthusiast, um, themed. Should we, sure. should we talk about what we got you when you had your first child? Stop. <laughs> yes, yes, no, yes. don't stop, we don't stop, don't stop. Sure. We need, no. I, just, I just said that to torture her, but I won't. I won't. Don't. Rich's favorite thing to do is embarrass me. That was, uh, uh, was curious how many years ago that was. He's going to college now. He's going to college. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's a long time. Yes. yes. Thank you, Rich. We're going to wrap this up before we get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I know we have editing capabilities. So. There you go. Yes, Okay. So uh, thank you for sticking around for the outro game. It's one of my favorite parts of uh, having guests on to get to maybe play, maybe slightly, slightly irreverent. What's that? It was, it was never an outro game until now. Yeah, it used to be an intermission <laughs> game, but this favorite. is a shorter interview. Okay. Yeah. The games are your favorite. Okay. We know this. Yes. Okay. They're, they're my favorite. So Especially I made when up Crystal a game. wins. Yes. Mm-hmm. The, these two can't win this game because I wanted to make it shorter. Okay. So this is called Which Furk is the Best Furk? Okay, it's a series of multiple choice questions where you get to choose the best FERC of the options I propose. Okay, so I got to choose okay. some options for you. Um, you ha- and I also ask that you show your work, meaning you give us some explanation okay. around why you chose it. Right, show show your work. Um, so, are you ready? Yep. Okay, let's do it. Which FERC is the best FERC? Ariana Grande's "Thank You Next," covered by Vitamin String, Vitamin String Quartet as hold music. That's option A. Option B, a piano cover of Paparazzi by Lady Gaga as hold music. Or last, option three, Journeys Don't Stop Believing as hold music for Ferk's uh, hold music. Well, um, I will pick Journey, I think, of the three. You're going to pick Journey. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the right thing. Um, I would say that, I would say that uh, just by way, do you want me to go into the background of yeah, the whole music? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, uh, so as you, you know, everyone's experienced COVID differently, but FERC, uh, after I think March 2020, we began our public meetings, moved our public meetings to a virtual situation where we actually, all the commissioners called in because of IT problems, we couldn't even do video, but we, we, had, we all called in from our houses and, and it lasted quite a bit. And the first couple of months we had the regular Muzak that's played before a commission meeting starts and it was incredibly boring. So we said, you know, we really have to you know, gin things up a little bit. So what we did is we had uh, each commissioner do their own playlist. Okay. And, are, you know, did you share them on Sp- Spotify? Um, you should. I don't think so. I think, I think we are now doing that with that, with, 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 with that, that list that's is, is, is evolved on. I'll explain that in a second. But so each commissioner did that. We, we ran out, after five months, we ran out of uh, options there. So we actually, um, we had uh, different offices within FERC. We have about, I think we have 13 different offices within the commission. Um, they now actually put together their list. So for instance, the Office of General Counsel did it recently and their first song was the theme from the Law, law and Order. You know, things like that. <laughs> so it's actually kind of funny. It's actually a fun way for to, to, to have staff that are working remotely still in many cases kind of collaborate on things. And uh, it's uh, very interesting, the different commissioners. I don't have, uh, I know what my list was, but I can't, but different commissioners had very different musical taste. Can very you different. give us a sense of what you, uh, your playlist was? But what's your, what, what was your first song when you did your playlist? Um, well, I had, uh, I'm, I'm a, people probably don't know, I'm a big Graham Far- Parker fan. I don't think many people know him, but I had, uh, 
a, a couple of Graham Parkers, Joe Jackson, um, Elvis Costello, um, Tom um, Petty, and uh, uh, Dire Straits. Mm. I think those were those were the songs that I ended up playing. I had I went through in great detail. So which Dire Straits though? Because well, I mean, there's a couple well, of risky choices. Exactly. So I, I chose <laughs> Romeo and Juliet, which I really like a lot. Okay. I think it's a good song. But so um, it, well, money for nothing when you call in. <laughs> well, yes. Well, it's funny you say that because I actually in one of my descents I cited to money for nothing and then I struck it out after I went and looked at the lyrics. Yeah. Um, so it's, it was not in there anymore. Um, but uh, I think we turned it into like burning money or something like that. But um, the uh, I, you had to you have to go through in great detail the lyrics of each song. So there's a lot of songs that I had picked originally that I had to strike out yeah. when you listen to, when you think through the lyrics a little bit. Do but you go through it yourself, or do you have someone I, on staff go through? I did it myself. I did it myself. I don't I don't know how to upload it. Someone did that, but I just went picked out the songs, figured out the time it takes because there's a limited amount of time that you can do on these things. But yeah. uh, it was it's uh, some of the commissioners like I think Commissioner Phillips when he came in he had a great pit playlist, a lot of Motown and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, Commissioner Daly had uh, it was more, um, you know, like classical music. I think it, was, it actually is a good way of, see, of seeing each each commissioner's uh, different personalities. Absolutely. Who, well, we got more. Yeah, were these actual um, your A, B, and C? Oh yeah, they oh, were songs. Right. They were songs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, they were so, the, they were the whole. Uh, thing. Don't stop believing. Journey. Whose playlist was was that? Do you know? It was one of the commissioners. We don't know for certain. Yeah, we just okay. know that it was. A it probably song. was with the Office of Enforcement yeah. or something. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. It sounds like them. Okay, I, that was just the first yeah. one. We, we have great context now. This the the next the next. Which Ferk is the best Ferk? Best Ferk is around soundtracks. So, uh, which Ferk is the best Ferk? A the Bridgerton soundtrack. B Game of Th- Thrones theme music. C instrumental accompaniment from Hidden Figures. Oh. D the Inception soundtrack, or E the Lion King instrumental as hold music. Which do you think is the best Ferk? And apparently, some department at Ferk is going to decide, uh, going to uh, hear what you say, and then decide <laughs> whether uh, you like them the best. Well, this goes to show you my lack of. I, 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 the only one I've heard is actually the Lion King. Instrumental. So. Actually, I think that is the wrong answer. I love the Bridgerton soundtrack, <laughs> and I recommend it. Actually, the Bridgerton soundtrack is great work fantastic. music. No yeah. way. No, yes, it it's I had no idea. Instrumental covers of pop music. Of really pop, topical recent pop music that's uh, covered, like you know. That's why I picked Journey too, because it's more my my it's my style. era. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So okay. you you may or may not realize from the the both the enthusiasm and the questions themselves that this became quite a thing on energy twitter um it did it, yeah it was uh, it well, was a lot of fun to read about i i can't say i spent much time on hold myself but uh, just reading about it was enjoyable so a little more background to this so um we played the music before the commission meeting starts and the commission meeting is supposed to start at eastern time 10 a.m on a thursday uh, the, i think it's the third or fourth thursday of every month the um uh, sometimes uh, we don't start quite on time. In large part, there's, there, you know, we may be finishing up an order. We have to get a, you know, maybe a couple sentences added. Maybe there's more negotiations going on without getting into too many details. It's been frustrating at times because it's taken us, and sometimes we start like an hour and a half, two hours late. So people hear the soundtrack and then they hear it again. And by the third time, they're on Twitter complaining. <laughs> <laughs> about it. So I'm very sensitive to that. So last meeting, we actually started at 10.05. I was very proud of that. That is you a should fabulous sequitur. That is amazing. <laughs> okay, so which FERC is the best FERC? Last question. I'm not sure all of these have been on there, but they were suggested, I think, on okay. Energy Twitter as potential ones. So A, Mo Money, Mo Problems. <laughs> B, Every Breath You Take. C, Power of Love. Or D, starting on time. Which FERC is the best FERC? Starting on time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for doing it. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. I hope that was laugh track. That was laugh track. Going for applause. (laughs) (laughs) I should label them. I think we're getting laughter and clapping at the same time now. But thank you. This was a lot of fun. Hopefully you. It was. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. This is the first game where I've actually learned something. This was great. Good. What are you talking about? I have no idea. The soundtrack's pretty good. I didn't know. Yeah, they're great. (laughs) Thick and through thin for public power enthusiasts without and within. Roll on, enthusiasts, roll on. Roll on, enthusiasts, roll on. Roll on, enthusiasts, roll on. We're likely recruiting you to come and join on. Roll on, enthusiasts, roll on. We bring in some people way smarter than us. 
those in the industry with knowledge to trust we know we aren't perfect sometimes it's a bust but we'll roll on enthusiasts roll on Thanks to Chair Glick, Crystal, and Matt for the informative conversation on electric markets. This is the fourth in the series on electric market enthusiasm. We have more coming up because as Travis Kavula recently highlighted on Energy Twitter, quote, discussions about electric market structure, retail rate design, and transmission just became even more important, unquote. That in light of the recent passage of the Inflation Reduction Act out of the U.S. Senate on Sunday great news. To make sure you don't miss the next episode or other great bonus content, you can sign up for an unintrusive newsletter with links to all the ways to consume this fascinating content at publicpowerunderground.substack.com. Links in the show notes. Otherwise, you can subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. You can also get the fabulous merch on Shopify, including uh, some wonderful quarter zips and possibly some energy enthusiast merch if I get the time before this gets published. Public Power Underground is a production of Klatskin IPUD and News Data. The views expressed are your own and not the official views of Klatskin IPUD, News Data, or the organization of the guests also appearing on Public Power Underground. Public Power Underground is electric utility and electric utility adjacent news from a power department's perspective. It's written and directed by Klatskin IPUD's power department, led by me, Paul Dock. And it's edited and published by the Stellar team at Pioneer Utility Resources, led by associate producer Sarah Wooden. Our theme song, Roll On Enthusiast, was rewritten, performed, and recorded by Aaron Guillory and Ian Bledsoe. Public Power Underground for electric utility enthusiasts. Public Power Underground, it's work to watch. <laughs>